Yeah, I'm so fortunate today to have with us Tom Zackies, the CEO and founder of Loop and of TerraCycle. These are two companies that we've been following for a long time. And I've got tons of questions for Tom because I've actually used both his products. So um, yeah, I just want to jump right in. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thanks for having me. Real pleasure. Well, I guess I'd love to jump in first on TerraCycle. Um, that's, I think, the company you started first. Um, yes. Can you tell us what TerraCycle is and what you guys are up to today? Yeah, absolutely. So in its core, TerraCycle is a waste management company. Uh, we've been around for 20 years now, national in 20 countries. And uh, what we try to do is uh, really two things. First, and what you probably, uh, what most people may know us for is help recycle those things you can't locally recycle. And so we have recycling programs for everything from cigarette butts to dirty diapers and hundreds and hundreds of other waste streams all over the world. And then the second thing we do is try to help companies integrate waste into their products. So they're making their products from unique uh, forms of recycled waste. So everything from ocean plastic to rock and roll festival waste to even the garbage on the top of Mount Everest, uh, just to name a few examples. So that's basically what TerraCycle is all about. I guess I'm going to date myself a little bit here. When we used to collect stuff in the schools in my town and at the farmer's market, a lot of things I remember that we would kind of uh, tell the public about was we would take things that were really hard to recycle and no one would take things like juice pouches, which I, I'm dating myself because they're not that popular anymore. <laughs> um, and that those could be made into like we had some juice pouch bags, I remember, that we'd show people. Um I think where a lot of people get stuck and I get stuck is when you look at like a toothpaste um, tube or you look at like you're talking about a dirty diaper. It's like, come on, you're not really recycling this. Um, can you tell us, like, give us some examples like, yeah, what do you do when you get those boxes full of stuff that can't be recycled? Totally. Well, why don't we do this? You give me a waste stream and I'll tell you what we do. OK, okay well, dirty diapers. <laughs> I can't believe you do anything with dirty diapers. What, what? Dirty diapers. OK, <laughs> so each type of garbage, I'll give you the preface once and then we'll go a bit more rapid fire. But each type of garbage is like a unique animal, uh, but it is an animal. Nevertheless, it's a type of garbage. And the two really three questions that have to be solved to make something like a dirty diaper uh, become recyclable is how do we collect it? How do we process it? And then actually the most important part is how do we construct a business model where someone's going to fund it, right? And actually pay for it. So let's talk dirty diapers. So dirty diaper recycling is now live in Amsterdam. Uh, we've been running it there for a few years and actually it's now growing. It's going to be launching soon in Japan and in France, uh, not yet in the US. Um, the collection, I mean, it's literally a shit show, right? So we have to have uh, um, these smart bins, you know, that are very much smell control. Because you can imagine if uh, wherever you put them at a retailer, at a nursery, and think hot summer, you know, like everything that can make something festy. Um, we really put a lot of innovation into making sure that you could walk by it and never know it was there. We have a special bin that we, you know, that, that we ask consumers to put any brand of diaper into. And then we service those and it goes over to a facility where now diapers, we always look at, can it be reused? Dirty diapers, not really. Can it be upcycled? That's like the example you gave of the uh, juice pouches into backpacks. Not really. So we then, uh, the bottom would be recycling where we look at how do we rip it apart and take apart all the materials. So diapers first go through a sterilization process. Then from there, they get shredded and separated into what it's made from. So diapers are made from cellulosic materials, like the fluffy stuff. Uh, you also got this crystal inside called SAP or super absorbent polymer that absorbs the urine basically. And it's like those crystals that when you put liquid to it, get very big. And then there's basically plastics. All the sheetings are polypropylene or other forms of plastic. And when you shred it, you can separate those things and reconstitute each, not necessarily to make a new diaper, but those crystals are really good in the agriculture industry, you know, to hold water, right? Uh, especially in uh, more uh, areas that are a bit more arid. Um, the cellulosic material can be made into new cellulosic material and the plastics can be recycled into like rigid uh, plastic products. And net net, that's diaper recycling. And then I, I mentioned the third and important part is in that example, Pampers is who funds the bill. And they're doing it, hoping that you may prefer their brand over the competition because they're offering diaper recycling. There's a bit more logic to it, but that's the simplification. I OK, so this is making sense to me that if I'm a plastics manufacturer or a company like Pampers and I can put on my box, you know, can be recycled through TerraCycle, you know, more customers are going to want to come to me. Exactly. And then, you know, we do have to really uh, uh, help the brands, you know, think about how to bring that to life, because the more they see value, the more they're going to grow it all over the world. And this is the trick to sustainability if you're impregnating sustainability into business is the more you let the business know how it's going to drive traditional points of value, right? Like increased market share, you know, uh, whatever it may be. That's what's going to then make them be like, wow, I'm not doing this because I'm like protecting against the risk, but I can lead with it. And instead of doing marketing dollars, I can you know, do it here. And that's how the platforms really uh, fundamentally grow.
So instead of there being like a diaper tax, and we're going to tax every diaper that gets sold, and it's going to put it into a diaper recycling fund or something like that, then you'd have businesses basically trying to get around it. So it'd be like, oh, these aren't diapers. These are natty packs, and they're for your little munchkins. They're munchkin holders, you know? And then it's like, okay, so they're trying to get around it, or they're trying to get out of it, or um, it'll be very unpopular, and people will be like, the diaper tax is going to make diapers more expensive for everybody. And that's uh, unacceptable. So you're kind of circumnavigating all of those problems that when we try and like solve them through government, which is where you kind of think like, hey, this is the government. We solve problems that normally businesses don't solve because profit drives everything. And if, if we don't have to deal with dirty diapers, then that's great. We can just wash our hands of that and you just put it in the trash and whatever. Instead, you're flipping it on its head and saying like, oh, I might actually want to buy the diapers if I know that you're, you're appealing to the, the consumer uh, to do the right thing. Right. Yeah. And I think all these factors come into play, right? It's, it's not like one or the other. So, for example, America is not great at legislating waste solutions. In fact, in, you know, you could say a lot of the things about America where it's the only wealthy country that doesn't, right? And fill in the blank, like healthcare and, and, and other things. But it's also the only developed country that doesn't have what's called extended product responsibility taxes. So everywhere else, if you make a package, you have to do what you just described and pay a tax. Uh, and that money is used to help boost recycling rates. An important backdrop here, just to sort of, you know, jump on this, if I may, is that what makes something recyclable is not whether it can be, right? That's what we usually think. It's like recyclers are recycling what they can. And if the stuff that you can't recycle, it's not, it's because it can't be. There's some technical wizardry issue. It's the recyclers are not in the business of that. They're in the business of extracting from your waste what is valuable and selling it. And what is not valuable, they won't bother. It's urban mining, right? So when you put something in the recycling bin, what happens? A garbage company picks it up and they take it to a thing called a MRF, which is like basically a sorting center. And it gets on a conveyor belt and either robots or people, usually people, sort out the stuff they can sell at a profit. And that then actually goes to what you would call a recycler who melts it down and makes it into something new. But it's really mining for value, right? And what makes that diaper or chewing gum or razor blade or, I mean, you know, list off most objects in the world, not recyclable, it's simply the opposite. It costs more to collect and process and the results are worth. And so we somehow have to tease out whether in countries like Europe, maybe through legislation in countries like America, maybe more voluntarily, someone who would happily say, I'm going to pay for that. I see. So the example that I gave you, the reason I gave you that example is because I'm American. And so when I think of like, oh, well, we could pass that legislation. My first thought is that that'll never pass. That'll never go through. It'll Right. Okay. But if I but you're, stay with the American, Americans are great capitalists. If you're a retailer, right, and I can tell you, hey, if you run recycling for, let's say you're a cosmetic boutique for cosmetics, and that gets people into your store, you may be like, wow, I can drive foot traffic through recycling maybe better than if I can uh, run a TV commercial or run a coupon, something that actually doesn't even make the world any better, just, you know, it's straight marketing. Right. And so for me, whatever tools I can lever, whatever I can sort of put on the table, the more I can do, the bigger these recycling programs become. It sounds to me like now, after doing this for decades, like right, you're in your second decade of doing this, it must, you've learned some tricks, I'm sure. And it's probably a little easier when you approach a company, you know, Procter and Gamble or some big company, and you're like, let's do this because you can point to all these successes. But what was it like when you first started? Because I know that you got into waste in an unexpected way. Maybe you could talk about your early yeah. years. Yeah, it definitely has been different. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, I mean, that's one of the nice things as you mature as a business, you know, you're, it gets easier to grow, right? So I'm originally from Hungary. I only mentioned that because I was communist when I was born there, right? And uh, I was born in 82, Chernobyl happened, you know, we escaped as refugees, uh, when sort of as, uh, you know, across Europe and then Canada. And then I went down to university in New Jersey, which is where I'm speaking to you from today. I now live here. And uh, I fell in love with entrepreneurship, you know, along the way. I mean, of course, come from communism to capitalism, it's like the best thing ever. It's literally the American dream. And, you know, fast, fast, this route in my eyes to fame and fortune, right? And I remember this sort of moment. Um, the first class I took at Princeton was Econ 101, and the professor gets up on stage and says, what's the purpose of business, right? That's a very appropriate sort of opening question. And the answer she was looking for was maximize profit to shareholders, which is the textbook definition. And I get it. I'm like not anti-profit, but is that, I bet you most people who interact with a company 
customers, employees don't care about that at all. They care about what service is provided or what product you know is is given. And then profit maybe is more accurately an indicator of health, right? If you're profitable, you can flourish and grow. And if you're not, the opposite happens. And so I was sort of thinking about how to create a business. I was just searching for this idea of like a business topic that put purpose first, but did that at a profit so it could flourish and, and grow. And um, you know, I fell into this sort of garbage topic. I mean, my friends, uh, this was before pot became a bit more, um, you know, uh, legalized, let's say. And uh, they were growing plants in their basement. They couldn't really make it work. It was up in Montreal. And they called me one day and they said they finally figured it out. So, of course, I get in my car, drive up, you know, uh, from New Jersey. And uh, yes, they were absolutely right. Plants were doing great. We enjoy, had a good night. And then I asked them, like, how did you make it work? And they said, we took organic waste, fed it to worms, took the worm poop and fed it to the plants. And like, that was awesome. But then it started, you know, getting this idea of garbage in my mind. And like garbage is the strangest topic filled with so many anomalies. So I give you just a couple just to sort of wet the noodle, right? We live in a pretty materialistic world. But isn't it weird that in such a world, everything we own and think literally everything, like the shelves behind you, the floor, you know, on that, you know, not just like the obvious stuff, like a, you know, like a candy wrapper everything will be property of a garbage company with no exception. Everything we possess in a world where our worth is somewhat linked to what we possess, mm. they will own it all. And 99% within the year we purchased it. Wait a minute. Say that again. 99%? 99% of what we buy will be property of a garbage company within the year it was bought. Is that by mass? Is that by item? I've heard that statistic by dollar, by like how you like, like how money is spent. Wow. But I mean, think about it. Most of what we buy are consumables. Yeah. And even the things that we perceive as durables, like clothing, have become consumables. Right. right? Like here's a, a sort of a neat stat on that. Like if you were if we were around 100 years ago, um, it, it, I know it for women, not men, but an average woman, you know, middle income would have bought two apparel items per year and used them for 20 years, uh, you know, before they became rags. Today, wow. 100 years later. It's 66 apparel items per year are purchased and worn three times on average before disposal. Everything is moving in that direction, right? Wow. And so, yeah, it's insane. So for me, when you see something like that, when you solve it and it's purposeful, it's a huge playground to play in. And since no one's innovating, the types of things we can do are really fun. I mean, you can, it's, it's like, imagine if like you had the internet and no one else was playing on it. Early years, you figure out that like vermicomposting is awesome. Waste streams are awesome. Yes. But how did you... How did you start a business? Like, how did you get the first company to be like, sure, I'll give you my, uh, I'll take back my juice packs or I'll give you money to, to take my juice packs. Like, how did you, how did you convince them to do that? Right. As you described, we first started as a worm poop company, right? Like I, I dropped out of school and literally what TerraCycle was, was taking organic waste, feeding it to worms, packaging it in used soda bottles and selling it at whatever Home Depot, right? Like that was our business. Mm -hmm. And we grew in over four years doing that. And then we started thinking, could we make other products out of garbage, right? Like literally juice pouches into backpacks. And so as we started doing that and we were able to get them sold, we had to go find the waste. And that's how we actually sort of invented these national recycling programs was by going to actually the first company ever. I think it was like companies like Cliff Bar and uh, Capri Sun and a few others who said, could we run a collection program so we can help make these products? And then what happened is we realized that we had put the product as the hero of our business. Like, let's make a thing and then find garbage to make it where the product is the hero, right? And, we, and, and as we started learning about, you know, recycling and, and, uh, and, and also what's, you know, what, what's happening and the scale at which it's happening with mm -hmm. consumer product goods, like the immense size of waste is just unbelievable. We realized that we should shift the hero of the equation away from the product to the garbage, so instead of starting with, I want to make a product, and then what garbage can I make? It was, I need to solve this type of garbage, and then what can I make it into? It may seem similar, but it's a fundamental shift. And then the whole thing just took off uh, 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 from there um, and has grown into, you know, sort of where we are. Now, at the beginning, you know, it's you got to MacGyver your way into all this, and you're like, uh, you know, just barely, uh, uh, you know, able to get the meetings, let alone sort of beg for business. Um but I'd say the biggest lesson I've learned in working with corporations around this topic, getting them to voluntarily fund, not like you were describing, like have it taxed or legislated, is not to lead with, you should do this because you're polluting the world, right? And you should take responsibility, which is the usual like social business point of view to do it. And honestly, that's what I care about. But instead to say, how do I help you achieve what you're trying to achieve, whatever your business goals are, but show you you can achieve that 
by doing something purposeful, like running a big recycling program, instead of, um, you know, launching TV commercials that, you know, um, may not necessarily do anything special, just communicate your product. And the more we did that, the more companies said, oh, these guys get what we're trying to achieve. And we'd, of course, love to do it in a way that makes the world better than in a way that it doesn't move the world forward. And what I love about TerraCycle is that it takes uh, a lot of people to make it work in a community if they want to do one of your programs, but it raises money. So a lot of kids are excited about, you know, hey, kids, gather up this junk or this trash um, and let's recycle it. And then they get excited about it. And I've seen kids like just come alive and just go pick up throughout their neighborhoods um, barrels and barrels of stuff that would have gone into the, you know, the landfill of the incinerator and now turned it back into, you know, useful stuff and shout out to Jerry and Christina, uh, to the, the best people in our community who do that. Um, and it's, it's just amazing what you can do to, in a school, for instance, you know, one week, the kids are just throwing that stuff in the trash. The next week it's like gold. You know, we've been, as a small company, we've donated just under $50 million in these, in exactly what you're describing. Right. Wow. And I think we need to, to enable recycling, which is the first step in a sustainable journey. Like, you know, before someone may cut out meat, may live in a small house, you know, may do things that are bigger lifestyle changes. Recycling is where we begin. So we've got to do that well. And it's not just about making things available, but we have to make them fun. And we have to get people excited because that actually gets more momentum uh, than just saying, here's a bin and I hope you use it. Now, let's move on to your second company, Loop. That's another product um, and service that Jesse and I have tried. Um, and so to describe this to, to people who are watching so that, you know, they know what Loop is. Absolutely. So Loop is a platform for reuse. What it does is uh, it enables consumer product companies to create reusable versions of their products. Think like Tide laundry detergent in reusable stainless steel or your you know ice cream with Hagen dazs also in re beautiful reusable packaging. And then you can uh, buy that uh, either in store or online from your favorite retailers like here in the US, Kroger and Walgreens and Ulta Beauty, just to name a few examples, or even Burger King. And uh, uh, you pay a deposit on the package when you get it. And then when you return it, not just to the retailer you purchase, but any retailer, you get your money back. And then instead of that package being you know, garbage or even being recycled, it goes to a state-of-the-art cleaning facility where it's cleaned and then the company refills it and sells it to someone else. It's sort of like how the milkman model worked back in the day, but imagine meeting everything. I mean, literally, you know, almost any consumer product uh, uh, and coming to life in, uh, uh, in, in retailers. Um, so that's basically how, how it works. And it, it launched about uh, two and a half years ago and has been on sort of a whirlwind of growth. It's now up in four countries, launching two months from now in Japan and then Australia, and uh, hopefully bringing a very convenient reuse opportunity to folks. So it's easy to play in reusables without having to like wash out your own bottle, take it to a refill station, and also really Get, get the brands, you know, people want and already consume. So, I mean, I think that people are used to uh, deposits, especially yes. in the United States. You know, there's bottle deposits and you can, you know, drive it all the way to, where is it, Maine and get 10 cents, you know, ooh. Um, but usually that's, that's not being reused. It's just being recycled. They're going to take that's it, right. they're going to grind it up, and then they're going to melt it down and turn it into something new. This is a, a de departure from that. And so you're paying a bigger deposit for this item because it's not just like... Uh, oh, I hope this doesn't end up, you know, polluting on the side of the road somewhere. It's like, this is an actually useful item. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of value in it because you can bring it back and and have it be completely reused. So what was the impetus for this company then? You know, when we were doing the worm poop thing, we asked ourselves, are we fulfilling our mission to eliminate the idea of waste? That's how it always began. It wasn't my aspiration wasn't to create a fertilizer company. It was create a waste solutions company. And we realized no, because we're not making, you know, the, the garbage, the hero. And that's how we did that first shift. We asked ourselves, you know, uh, maybe now five years ago, is recycling the answer to garbage? Because that's what we were doing and, and are still doing in a very big way. And we realized, you know, it's not. It's a solution to the symptom of garbage, but not to the root cause. If we don't have garbage, we don't really need recycling, right? And so then the question became, what is the root cause of garbage? And I would argue garbage was invented in the 1950s uh, when uh, disposable consumption became big. I mean, before that, we cobbled our shoes, we mended our clothes, we bought milk from the milkman, you know, and motor oil and perfume came in reusable packaging. It was a very different world. And it's this idea, I think, of like throwaway society is what created the modern idea of waste. And then all the data that backs that up on when garbage just exploded. And so then the question was, okay, how do we shift from a single use ecosystem to a reusable 
but but in a way that's going to appeal to everyone, not just the super hardcore you know consumers who are probably already going to package free stores and doing this sort of thing. Like, how do we get the Walmart shopper right uh, who buys Tropicana orange juice and Coke and whatever? And what we realized is that reuse already exists in a big way in the United States. Propane tanks, super reusable. Beer kegs, super reusable. And it's, that's not even appealing to eco people. It's just how those products are. But try to take your propane tank to the beer store or take the beer keg to wherever you got the propane tank and it doesn't work. And that's just two products. And so the basic idea was if we're going to really scale reuse, we have to solve that, right? We have to make it that you can buy something anywhere and return it anywhere, sort of like your recycling bin, right? Your recycling bin doesn't care where you bought that soda bottle. It just cares that it is a soda bottle. And so once we had that, that was sort of the essence of what we wanted to create as this this overall platform. And what got brands really excited about it was it's 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 sort of you know both against the uh, you know solving for the risk but all but much more about innovation because if you're a brand today what's happening your budget for packaging is decreasing every year because you're trying to squeeze cost squeeze cost squeeze cost have you noticed how packaging is always getting sort of thinner and I noticed this by the way on a monopoly board right it's one of my favorite games and um, but if you compare monopoly boards that are made today compared to like 50 years ago have you noticed the pieces are just like thinner you know, not solid, like it's just made, you know, uh, with, 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 with lower value materials. And that's the same in, I mean, absolutely everything. And that's a problem because you can't innovate. You can't really do cool things when every year your budget goes down. But if you shift the package to the point that you had mentioned earlier from being something that the consumer owns to something they borrow, then you can explode the investment in the package because it's now an asset. And that is what got everyone really excited about Loop is not just that it's more sustainable. I mean, absolutely. But they can now do things that they can never do before because they keep getting that package back. And so to your point, the deposit is not in bottle bills, which are good things. The deposit is a motivator to have you recycle more. That's its entire function. To get you to collect more and bottle bills do increase recycling rates. But in Loop, the deposit is actually what the package is worth. Right now, you can keep it. It's no problem. But that's what it's worth to the company who, you know, who wants it back. So they don't have to make it again. They can just clean it and, and fill it up. And that was the huge breakthrough, which is why we've seen it, you know, it move so quickly overall. And it's really interesting. I, I uh, studied as a plastics engineer. I haven't applied it much, thankfully. Um, but one of, I remember one of the lessons was like, okay, so we've learned how to make a bottle out of plastic. Now, how do we make it attractive con- to consumers? And it's like, so what you need is you want something that's ideally cold and also shiny because that's what humans like. They like cold, shiny things. Um wonder why uh you know metals and stuff like that good to have around rocks uh, maybe shiny rocks preferably um but the problem was how do you make plastic which is insulative so when you touch it it's warm and it's uh, naturally not that shiny you have to plate it with metal you have to do something to make the person want to buy it so you add some kind of reflective stuff but what you're actually able to do is package these items in glass and stainless steel, both of which are cold to the touch and shiny. And I think that's a really interesting point because when you're trying to reduce costs, I mean, obviously, you know, you wonder why the tequila is in such a fancy bottle. It's because you're not paying actually that much for the tequila. Um, you're paying partially for the bottle. They, they needed to grab you in the store and well, <laughs> you know, that it's a high margin item. So, I mean, I, I assume brands just love being able to pour money into packaging, but does it have to be standardized between all these brands? The, the way we sort of answered this, right, because there's this natural tension, the more standardized, the lower the cost is, right? It's we can get bigger cleaning equipment that cleans that package at greater scale, lowering the cost. And the less standardized will the exact opposite. But what we've determined here is Loop doesn't have an opinion on standardization. We let the companies decide, just like, frankly, today, disposable packaging has the same thing. Like, have you noticed the aisle of cereal? Everything is a box and a bag. And the only difference between Cheerios and whatever else is the artwork. But then you go over to the perfume aisle and every perfume object is like wildly different. So let the market decide. I mean, the, you know, the, the market knows what consumers want and where differentiation is important. And where it's absolutely not important. Like, have you noticed motor oil containers all look the same? 
right? Because clearly, probably it doesn't matter to whoever buys motor oil, but in uh, cosmetics, it really matters. So we, we let the markets decide. And if a company is really asking us, how do we make the cost lower? Well, we're going to recommend be standardized. But if they want to innovate and go into really amazing places, then you do anything you want, but the cost of cleaning that object will go up because the apples to apples comparison between, say, a shampoo bottle, you know, that's in plastic, like single use. And well, here's one. This is, say, a shampoo bottle. This is Pantene in loop, which is reusable, is in this in the plastic version. Whatever the cost of that plastic bottle is 100% in the price of your shampoo. You own it. Ironic, because of course you don't want it. In this one, what goes into the price of the shampoo when they calculate it is your use of this bottle and the cost of cleaning it. Right. And that's your apples to apples, uh, you know, uh, like one to one comparison. And uh, it's amazing to see these different industries go, you know, really in different directions. Um, I'll give you a fun one, though. We're actually launching beer in the UK in Loop with this really cool company called Brewdog. And they're going to put it into a growler. And um, we were running the economy. It's a stainless steel, like gorgeous, beautiful growler. And it turns out if you, uh, it's cheaper to buy, it's going to be cheaper to buy with them a whatever it is, a gallon of beer, like good premium beer in a stainless steel growler. It's going to be way cheaper to buy that, even if you keep the growler, than buying the growler empty on Amazon by like 50%. Is that wild? Wow. I want to ask you about the cost of cleaning because, um, you know, when we were using this, it really is cool to have your pantry full of stainless steel, you know, a thing of rice in stainless steel. It was just like, never seen that before. Mm -hmm. That That's awesome because normally it's in some bag that's falling over or whatever. So that was awesome. But then I did think about, okay, well, this has to go back to some kind of cleaning plant and like how... You know, is that like a huge cost or is that because it's, you know, so many of these coming back to a big plant that's done efficiently? Is it not a big cost? Yes. Right. So what I mean by that is in the short term, like right now, while Loop is still relative to single use packaging, tiny, right? Like really, even though we're working with all these big companies, the relative volume is still, still small. Um, it is expensive. Now, who's funding it? is not the consumer, it's the brands, you know, it's the retailer and it's us. I mean, we're not making money, we're, we're investing quite a bit into it. And I could say the same for all these brands and retailers. But at scale, it does become very competitive with uh, single use packaging. Um, and it just requires it to get to that scale, which is what we're really focused on right now. How do we make the volume of it be as big as possible? And you can look at models around the world where it already does exist at scale and functions very well. Like the entire beer industry in Canada is on returnable bottles. The entire beverage industry in Germany is returnable uh, bottles. And so if it can work there, it just it, it's very easy to extrapolate that it can work for, you know, your pasta sauce to your, you know, your rice, you name it. it we just got to get to that really big scale. So the name of the game on loop is as quickly as possible, trying to get the scale of it to go big, which is why we're partnered with like McDonald's and Burger King and all these places in an effort to try to get the volumes to be as high as possible. So what's the end game? I mean, what does going to the grocery store look like in this, I let's just call it a perfect world, um, where everything I buy is in a reusable container. So, I mean, is it like I go to the store one day and I have to buy a bunch of stuff and I have a deposit bill that's like $50, or is it just like I've been living my whole life doing this, so it's not that bad because I've just you know, brought back all of my stuff that I'm going to be buying, but full now? Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly like that, right? So the end state is that any retailer you walk into, like, I mean, honestly, whether it's a, a bowling alley or a movie theater, all the way to your grocery store or your auto shop, you would be able to, you know, buy whatever products you want now in, in, in a reusable context, right? So in consumables, that's, you know, like take like a, like a, you know, bottle of orange juice, you pay a deposit and then you pay for the juice and then you can take that and drop it off in any other retailer. So it's like really literally a throwaway experience and then you get your deposit back. And, you know, the more you do, you would have a bigger, let's call it deposit float, but you do that once and it just sort of rotates, right? Because you're, you know, you return something, you get money back, you buy something, it moves it up and you have this sort of float of deposit overall, which shouldn't at all in the end really increase your costs, right? Um, in what's really interesting in Loop as well, because we talked a lot about it in, in what we would call consumables, like stuff in a bottle where you consume it and you return to us an empty bottle. We're also in a few months launching reusable diapers in Loop with a big diaper brand here in the US or baby clothing in the UK. Now we talked about like clothing and the whole fast fashion problem. And what's interesting in let's call it a durable, right? Like not a consumable, but a durable. The way it works in say baby clothing is um, you when you buy it, you pay a cost to use it 
let's just say that's five bucks and a deposit to own it. And let's call that 10 bucks, just, you know, made up numbers. So you'd pay 15, but then when you're done, whenever, you know, your baby grew out of it, or, you know, uh, maybe you gave it to someone else and then their baby grew out of it. Like there's no time limit. When you ever, you return it, you get your deposit back 10 bucks. And then instead of having to make a new garment, we just uh, repair it, clean it and sell it again to someone else. And that, so this can be applied to, you know, any product where we use is an opportunity, right? And those are products that become waste, like baby clothing is a good one because babies grow out of their clothing incredibly fast, um, where there's an opportunity to improve design because you're moving from a, a, a disposable ecosystem to an asset so you can really increase design and where you're trying to solve for waste, right? So it's not for everything. It wouldn't be for Swiss watches, right? There's no, no benefit of reuse there uh, unless you wanted to rotate through styles, you know, really quickly perhaps. Um, but it does work as well in these other constructs. And that's the end point. Now at the beginning, it's sort of like the idea of organic, but instead of picking the fight on, you know, let's call it farming practices, we're picking it on reuse. So in the stores, it's already physically in. It's like a section of the store. Like you walk in and it's like all the loop reusable products are stacked together and you can then, you know, buy your what all these different things, your spreads and your crackers and your rice and whatever in a section of the store. And if consumers then vote for it, it'll get bigger and bigger. Oh, this is really interesting. The, I mean, first of all, the idea of having a system that can handle consumables, but then also this idea of durables, because I think that a lot of people have been noticing that certain durables, let's say power tools or let's say baby harnesses for your car or something like that. You, you look at it and you're like, okay, this is supposed to protect my, my child. Uh, you just had a baby. Uh, <laughs> so it's supposed to protect your child from harm in the case of a horrible car accident. And you look at it and what is it made out of? Injection molded plastic, you know, maybe a little bit of metal, but that's just to basically buckle it in with um, and, you know, seatbelt material, obviously. And it's like, why isn't, the, you know, why isn't this the most crazy, you know, safety shell kind of uh, an object? Well, it's because you have to spend some amount of money on it and then throw it away when you're done with it. And the crazy part about that, obviously, is that the car seat isn't going to you're not going to use it for forever so it's it's a somehow now a consumable so we've gone to the cheapification of that item um it's just like well how much do you really care about your kid you know that kind of thing it bothered me when i was like looking at my old car seat that we had in the basement right. and we were gonna like oh who can we give it to and of course styles have changed and that car seat is no longer safe even though it was good for little old me so i mean that was kind of a weird thing to me because I was looking at it like as a plastics engineer as someone who like knows how they made it and you're just going like this is made like a um, like something that you just store your old clothes in like yeah. a tote it's just so crazy this is the problem I mean you, you've nailed it and, and also the solution simultaneously is I mean take the car seat it's not only a disposable I think you go through two three car seats over a child's growth Right? You got the infant one, which is reversed. You got the like the little guy and then the bigger one and booster. It's probably four car seats per child. And you're absolutely right. It's 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 made to last like six to nine months, right? That's what it's designed into. And I you can say that for so many products. I mean, think about like especially things around children, like sports equipment. If you're playing football or hockey, how many sets of pads does the kid go through? But as, as their body grows, skis, you know, and 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 then you have the same thing in just the sheer idea of fashion, right? Like fashion creating uh, waste moments where it's not that it's not. You said you know the car seat's not fashionable, right? Now you said it, I think from a safety point of view, right? Maybe the safety standards have changed, but you can also say the same thing on clothing where the cut is not fashionable, even though the garment is absolutely fine. And I think. What we really need to think about is there's this huge opportunity to increase the quality of objects to astounding levels if we shift the concept of ownership. Because you can't keep the concept of ownership and increase quality because then you increase price and it won't work, but you can maintain price to your point uh, and even the profit to the retailers and everyone as long as you change the concept of ownership. And that's the key to the whole reuse movement. But don't you get pushback? Because if you were to approach me, a manufacturer of car seats, and told me this, I'd be like, get out of my office. I want to keep <laughs> making more car seats for people. I don't want to make one that lasts for 20 years. It's so funny you say that. So when we were putting this clothing deal together, right, we were thinking about this and we started first in, in loop uh, on the clothing side approaching manufacturers. And you know what? They weren't biting. 
And I think probably because of what you said, right? Like they're looking at it and saying, wait a minute, I sell, I make profit every time I sell a garment. I'd rather just keep doing that. If you consider this apples to apples, right? Uh, uh, and let's say you're a retailer. How do you make money? You, you buy, let's say a t-shirt for $5. You mark it up to seven. And when someone buys it, you've made two bucks. Okay. And you want to do as many of those as you can. In a reuse model, the used t-shirt, when it comes back, the cost of getting it back on a rack ready to sell is just the cost of collecting it, repairing it, cleaning it, and then putting it back on a hanger. And in fact, that's in many cases less than making the new one. So what happens is the, uh, the consumer pays less for a higher quality item because they get their deposits back when they return it. The retailer makes more money per sale, right? Because they're really selling the service of a cleaned item, not that item all over again. But there is a loser. There's not, it's very rare that you have in these cases all winners. The loser is the manufacturer who, instead of making, you know, 100 t shirts, makes one shirt that's worn by 100 different people. But this goes, I think, to the fundamental question of sustainability overall, right? I mean, sustainability is a phenomenally complex topic, right? Whether we care about the connection from, you know, palm oil to orangutan habitat or the garbage crisis, I mean, go on and on. It's very complex. And you can also argue you do something good here, something bad here happens, right? Like that whole spider web analogy. But there's one commonality that brings it all together, which is every environmental issue in the world is connected to the act of buying something. And it's connected to that act because when you buy, you're voting for more strain on our planet through mining, farming, some form of extraction and manufacturing. That's the real harm is you know, is leveraging that process. So if we can um, have what we've already extracted keep going around, we can greatly lower our, uh, our impact. And then the only other answer is we have to buy less stuff, which is actually probably the big white elephant in the room lurking in every sustainability conversation is we got to buy less. And I mean, I think that there's this uh, little feeling of panic for anyone who like it runs a business or understands how business works. It's it's run on growth. So you, you're like, OK, the factory keeps getting bigger. It We need more sales. So therefore, we need to hire more people. We need to make more stuff. So when you're thinking about the example of that T-shirt, you're going, OK, wait a minute. Now the manufacturer of the shirts is now going to be producing less shirts. And so that's where the panic is like, oh, oh, no, someone is not making as much money as they used to. Um but at the same time, we're all still living in the same way that we kind of were used to um, because I could still go to the store and buy a shirt and wear it. And that's really all I cared about the whole time. Well, and there was all these costs that we didn't count into the price of the shirts. Uh, you know, so there's all these hidden costs that were hurting the planet that now if we're not hurting the planet as much because we're wearing that one shirt a hundred times, it's just that we didn't get to count it in a money sense. And that's, I think the, the, the problem that we have here is that if we had, if someone would just price the shirt properly, then we would actually see a savings. Man, if we internalized all the externalities, we would be really good. Now we couldn't afford most things, you know, a, uh, a hamburger would probably cost a thousand dollars as it should. And frankly, it sort of did, didn't it? Right. Like back in the day, like hundreds of years ago, only rich people eat ate meat once a month, which probably meant that burger in today's money would have been like 10 grand, right? And then it's okay. It's just we are, we're, things are way too cheap. They're not priced to your very valid point accurately, right? So, you know, the, we can wait for that, but that's going to be the great hand of legislation, which is, you know, going to be a while away, especially in countries like the US, which are super free market, right? But I think we can nudge it in that direction by allowing business models to leverage it. I mean, just think it's the same sort of idea as what Airbnb has done in the hotel industry. By making the hotel our homes, you get a way better experience. You don't have to build hotels. It's it's a jujitsu. I mean, you're you're essentially like going to the retailer. You're cutting out not the middleman, you're cutting out the first man. Uh, and you're saying like, uh, yeah, your stuff isn't going to cut it dude like uh we could just keep reusing the stuff that you make and actually uh why don't you just make your stuff better because well, then you could charge more money for it it's exactly that like what's interesting is now the conversation inside these companies on clothing is not how do i make the cheapest baby whatever onesie or t-shirt it's about how do i make the most timeless fashion stain resistant crazy durable nothing can come off that's the conversation so you're going to make fewer but you're going to make them way higher quality. And and I love your point about Airbnb because I think a lot of people thought when Airbnb comes around, hotels will go out of business. In fact, the opposite has happened. 
I'm not going to think, hey, let's go to the Outer Banks and stay at a hotel. I'm going to say, let's go to Airbnb uh, on the Outer Banks. And so I just made a trip we wouldn't have made. And right. so I just helped that economy there with our tourist dollars that they wouldn't have had because of Airbnb. So like a whole right. economies have sprung up all over the place. It's created a new business, but we're not thinking that in the beginning. We're always like you were saying, just like... <gasps> Something bad going to happen right. if Tom gets his way. Well, and it's similar with Uber. I mean, Uber is the Airbnb of cars, to so to speak. It's not a perfect analogy because with Airbnb, someone doesn't have to be in the room <laughs> steering it. But, you know, that that concept where it's just like, uh, yeah, using something like a car uh, more efficiently instead of it sitting in your driveway 95% of the time, um, if you had it out driving, it's, if it could drive itself, um, which is something we talk about a lot on this channel, um, then you could extract all the value from it and you could build it in a completely different way. You could, you know, because for all the people who are like, oh, but people will throw up in it. It's like people have thrown up in taxis forever. Um, but OK, uh, yeah, now you could make it where it's just like, yeah, the whole interior gets peeled away or can be washed with a big spray gun or something that would make you feel better. Like all of this Airplanes. is possible. <laughs> Airplanes. <laughs> it's the difference between cars and airplanes. By the way, isn't there this, there's an app Turo, right? Which is exactly Airbnb for cars. Yes. Right? And you can just take someone's car and pay a, a literally Airbnb someone's car. Yeah. Yes. You know, I think we made a big mistake. We used your product loop uh, about a year and a half ago, and we were kind of like trying to get the first ones here. And I think we made two mistakes. One is I thought that it was aimed at me. I'm, you know, largely plant-based diet and organic and everything. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of Tropicana and this Hagen does, but that's not really me. And I was like, what? He's trying to appeal to me, but he hasn't appealed to me. No, you weren't trying, trying to appeal to you. You weren't right. trying to appeal to me. I already go with my bags to the store and fill them. <laughs> you were trying to appeal to like my sister who doesn't eat like me. And so that's the mistake I made. The second mistake I think I made was being a super early adopter. I was expecting that the product would be fully ready in every p way. But now you're mentioning this, some new things that sound awesome. Like you can return this at a Burger King. Um, whereas before you had to just bring it to the UPS guy. So like, can you tell us how it's evolved over the past year and a half? So the first part I, I want to highlight is we're not trying to, you're absolutely right. We're not trying to appeal to you. We're trying to appeal to the biggest segment of the population, the mass consumer, which is why we're partnering with all those big brands, right? Uh, now we're for everyone. We have, you know, uh, uh, there's about a brand joining loop every day and it's all over the spectrum. But the main focus, if you ask who are we proactively calling, it's whoever controls the biggest segment of the market so we can get to the masses because we got to scale these issues quickly. And you're already doing the right thing, right? I got to get the people who are maybe, you know, don't believe in climate change or aren't uh, uh, eating a plant diet and so on and so forth. And so that's the first, right? Um, now, the goal of Loop, again, is a platform. Now, every retailer was looking at us like, this is crazy. Like, is this going to work? So we had to launch learning platforms. And that's what loopstore.com is, which is a platform where we can learn and understand, you know, what is the early behavior, so on and so forth. But we're not a retailer. We were doing things there that is not our core. We're literally a garbage company. And what the loopstore.com, which is now, you know, live in a number of different countries proved is that there is appetite. People really like it. They like it for different reasons. Turned out, like, I thought people liked it because it's reuse, right? Like, save the planet. Turns out people first like it because it's beautifully designed. What a selfish reason, right? Second, because they think it's healthier to get a product not in plastic. Again, quite a selfish reason. And then third, probably the same reason you liked it is that it's eco-friendly, right? But it's interesting that we first care about, like, how it affects us and how cool we look. But whatever, if that's what floats your boat, fine, we'll make everything look really cool, right? And, and, and play into it. But the, the, that made way for what's happening now, which is every retailer we're working with, I mean, 15 big ones around the world, taking it physically in store. So you'll be able to go into a Kroger in Portland in a few months or a Walgreens in New York or soon a Burger King end of year in those same cities. So you're, you can, uh, once you bought it in the first store, you can walk by another store that may have loop enabled and drop it off in their bin. Right. So that it, because what we learned is that what do consumers, the mass market consumer want, right? They want first convenience. By far, it's the most important thing. So like, you know, when you hear that question, will you pay more for organic products? It's not really framed properly because really what we've learned is people first want everything to be really easy. Then they want their products to be filled with features and benefits. And for some, sustainability is a feature and a benefit, but unfortunately not for everyone. And then they want those two things, the convenience and all those features to come at a good price. They want it to be priced fairly. And that's actually the equation. So convenience is the very top of the rung. Changing people's worldview is 
phenomenally difficult. And this is what the sustainability movement tries to do all the time is behavior change. I mean, can you imagine if, you know, let's just say, you know, for sake of argument, you are an atheist and I tried to make you believe in God, that would be super hard. And you're one person. How do I do that for the masses and invest all that energy? I'd rather just play into what you already care about. So if you care about shiny objects that are super, you know, convenient and affordable, I got to give you that and let the system be uh, better. It's just like, frankly, how I think Tesla had the breakthrough on. It's not about it's eco. It's a better car. It's beyond meat. It's not about, you know, preaching to you about veganism and animal cruelty, all true things. It's just a better burger selling right beside the meat. I mean, that's what's going to scale these things is not trying to play into behavior change because that is cultural shifts. I mean, that's pretty you know pretentious if anyone thinks they can pull that off, right, in a short period of time. And so we need it to feel as much like disposability as possible. And, and that's what's rolling out right now. Is And for us, that's why Burger King is exciting or McDonald's. You'll be able to go into Burger King later this year and buy your Impossible Whopper and soda in a reusable pack. Pay a little deposit and maybe drop it off at a Walgreens. So when we started Loop a little while ago, we had talked to some of our viewers about it. And some of the things that people had said were like, oh, I'm really worried about the carbon footprint of getting all of these things sent in, uh, you know, heavy stainless steel or glass. How do you get around that? How do we uh, make it so that the stainless steel or the glass isn't traveling that far? Well, so, so two points. Um, one is that distance does affect carbon, but way less than people think, right? So the amount that you could, the sensitivity on a life cycle analysis on how far you can ship is much bigger than folks think. It's still a true statement. Every mile is a bit more, but with industrial density and, and scale, you can really ship a lot of, uh, a, a lot of miles uh, uh, before the reusable becomes worse than the single use, right? So that's, the, that's very important to note. With that said, what we're doing is building regional facilities, right? So right now we're uh, doing uh, cleaning facilities on a country basis, but in the US, our plans are to have seven regionally located facilities so that you're always shipping, you know, basically to one of seven, whichever is the closest, probably an average of max thousand miles. And then from there, um, it, it actually does get significantly better from a carbon point of view than single use packaging. You know, important to note, not in 100% of cases, right? Like, there's no silver bullet in sustainability other than not buying something. I think that is the only true silver bullet. But outside that, there are situations where that disposable package may be so ridiculously efficient. Like imagine comparing a bag, like a mesh bag of potatoes, like 40 pounds versus putting those potatoes into a stainless steel bucket. Okay, that's never the, the disposable mesh bag will always be better. But in the majority of cases, reusable is better than disposable uh, in a reasonable uh, supply chain. Do you think that this can scale to bring us back 100 years to where we were already doing this, like where <laughs> we had the milkman and where we had pretty much everything was you wore your clothes until they wore out and then you fix them yourself? Like, do you think we are going to go back to that? I don't think that it's about going back in history, right? It's about honoring the past and inventing the future with it, right? So you know, what, what, what is, we have to think about what's amazing about disposability. It gives us range. It gives us the ability to experience, you know, a different t-shirt every day if we so wished, right? It gives us not one type of milk, but like, you know, a hundred types of milk made from cows, made from almonds, made from, you know, cashews. I mean, you name it. We need to enable that convenience and range and so on but by honoring the learnings of the past, right? Like, uh, you know, and, and sort of rebooting it, right? Uh, uh, in a way where we think about what worked back then and pull those little things, like a deposit idea really worked. Let's bring that back and make the packaging an asset. But still we're pushing to the future. So let me give you an example of how far this goes, right? So in Japan, we're launching Loop in the two months. And one of these food companies, they're Ajinomoto, which uh, is the bit, one of the biggest in Japan food companies. They're like a craft, you know, in, in, in Japan. They said, hey, wait a minute. If the package is an asset, sure, we can make it out of fancy materials and make it super hip, like you saw some of the examples, but we can go further. They're actually embedding IoT onto the packages that are going to do real-time humidity and temperature readings of the content. So on your phone, it says, your spice is this fresh. Or, hey, it's in a humid spot. Maybe you want to move it to a drier spot to get more freshness. Like things like that. You can't do that if the package is going to be owned by the consumer because that implementation of technology will be too expensive. So I'll give you another one just to show you how far this can go. 
we were dreaming uh, sort of in an innovation day. I'm like, what can you do? Because we have to have a direct relationship with every human being's individual package for the one pragmatic reason of getting deposits back. I have to give you your deposit back, which will be different than the deposit I'm giving someone else. And yes, there's interesting data there and so on we can leverage, but that's sort of on the surface. What we realize is you can go one step deeper because certain products or waste streams carry pure diagnosable samples. So some examples, we put water filters on our water, like a Brita filter. So it means encapsulated in the filter is all the crud of our water. Well, would you like that filter when it's picked up to go to a laboratory, analyzes the crud in your water, tells you, hey, by the way, <laughs> I don't know if the Brita filter is going to help you with your water. You know, you may want to do something different or whatever. No one ever does. Your air conditioned filter, you know, has anyone ever thought about measuring like how much mold is in their air and so on? That's like filtration products or your cat's pet litter carries a sample of the cat's fecal matter where you can learn a lot about, you know, their state of their health. We're actually launching in a year and a half with one of the biggest diaper brands in the world, exactly that for children diapers. So you'll be able, imagine like 23andMe meets your, your waist where you buy a little kit, you put your one diaper into it, send it in, but not doesn't go to a recycling facility like TerraCycle or a reuse facility like Loop. It literally goes to a laboratory, analyzes the microbiome of your fecal sample and tells you, here's what's happening with the health of your child, right? Your, your femcare product uh, uh, or your, your sister's femcare product, you know, carries menstrual blood samples, your toothbrush, saliva, your razor blade hair, you see where this goes, right? Like, there's so much you can unpack once you start changing the relationship of waste. And you've really changed the way that you look at waste. I think that so many people are just like, it's going. And as soon as you see it as like, well, it's coming to me, what am I going to do with it? Because uh, it's not going to just go in a hole in the ground. Uh, then you start saying, well, what can I do with it? Well, gee, I mean, the water filter example and the air filter. I mean, I live right next to a highway. So I, of course, bought an air filter. But uh, yeah, I, I look at it when I'm <laughs> replacing it and I go, gee, this one certainly is black compared to the other one. I wonder what's in it. I don't know. Throw it away. Well, can you imagine when you have aggregated data? Like This is when we're talking with some of the companies we're working on this with water filters is that if you then have enough density of information, you can suddenly start mapping out a town and saying there is a new Flint coming up. Right. Yeah, yeah. And get early indicators of, hey, maybe we maybe the pipes in that particular town should be fixed before someone really gets hurt. Right. Because you can then start getting sort of heat maps. So you could do that with air filters. You could do it with water filters. You could do it with any of these things because you could start understanding these sort of aggregate data sets. And it's through time. So you could say, like, starting April 23rd, uh, we started to get uh, samples back that contained something. And you'd go, okay, well, what happened? Right. Oh, that place opened. What are they doing? Oh, we're right. pumping from this old well. W why are you doing that? Let's test it. Hey, what the heck? Instead of it being like years later and everyone in the town has cancer and you're like, well, I wonder why. No, and, and I love just from a purely consumer point of view, going back to what you said about, you know, the consumer now can get a better bottle. Like I had a bottle of Saratoga water the other day. It's a beautiful blue bottle. And when I was done with it, I was like, I don't want to get rid of this bottle. I want to keep the bottle. Mm -hmm. But now it makes it for, you know, for the retailer worth doing that because it's like, yeah, we can give you a really nice package, something you're really proud to have because we can put some more money into it. Yeah. I think that's the key is, is this idea of, you know, like we're all very focused on plastic being the evil in the waste and in the waste topic. I would say that it's not that plastic is the evil. It's that we dishonor it by using it once, you know, plastic is amazing what it's been able to do, but no molecule can be evil or, or, or benevolent. I think it's how we use it, how we wield it. Right. And if we can have things built to be, you know, to, to be able to continuously go around, right? The exact opposite of planned obsolescence and much more into repairable, modular, reusable. Then I think we have a better chance of being able to maintain some of our consumption because in the end, look, what's going to be the great reckoning? Either nature is going to force us, you know, uh, 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 into balance or we're going to get there in our own accord. Right now we're on the first path by far, right? But it's going to be one or the other. But the first one is painful and bloody and not just for us, but the fellow, you know, plants and animals traveling on this planet. Right. The second one, I think we can get there, but I don't think we can get there through austerity and just say, hey, everyone become a monk. You know, I think we need to somehow play into people's you know, selfish desires, but to do it in a way that gets them there. 
Right. Well, it's so interesting you bring up plastic because, I mean, I, I, you know, learn about plastic. They tell you about all the great, you know, properties of it. Oh, this one can resist all sorts of solvents and this or that, or and this one is bulletproof. And, oh, isn't that amazing? And then they go back down to, okay, so which plastic do you choose for this? And I'm like, oh, to, to do the bulletproof one. Oh, do the one that's resistant to all the solvents. And they go, nope, it's the cheap one. Pick the cheap one. Every single time, listen to me, pick the cheapest plastic you can get away with and then make it as thin as you possibly can because that will make it, because guess what? When you go to uh, injection mold that puppy, you want to be able to spit the part out faster, which means you have to cool it. The whole cost of the whole thing is just waiting for the damn plastic to cool down. So the thinner you can make it, the faster you get it out of the mold. The mold costs the most, you got to use the mold. It's all about making it thinner, making it crappier. And the crazy part is when you have a big block of plastic, it's one of the most indestructible things you could get your hands on. You're just like, oh my gosh, I can I can beat it against rocks. I can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. It's just that we don't use it properly, exactly like you're saying. Obviously, microplastics are a problem, especially if you're beating against rocks, but uh, used in the right applications, uh, there have been plastic items that are still in use today. It's just we design them properly. This is it, right? I think I think you've nailed it. It's it's this. I we, we have to get away from the mentality of how do you make things absurdly cheap and very short life, which go hand in hand, by the way. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being with us today. This was just really eye opening. I'm I really I want to get back in touch with you in a year or so and find out how Loop is going and find out what you're doing because I mean. Just, just I'd, I'd like to be in on one of your innovation meetings there because that sounds awesome. Uh, just to go back to first principles and figure out like what, hey, what could we do this stuff? You know, with this stuff, this that's just eye opening. I didn't think we'd even go down that road talking about this today. I thought we'd just be talking about plastic waste. So right. this was really refreshing and awesome. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Well, thank you so much for chatting. It's been a really, really fun conversation. I appreciate you guys. So thank you for uh, for doing it. And let's for sure connect again in a year and see see uh, what's happening. So if people want to get involved in what you're doing, whether it be with Loop or with uh, TerraCycle or anything else that you're working on, uh, just let the people know how they can uh, do that. Yeah, I think three ways. So TerraCycle, you just go to TerraCycle.com and it'll start your journey on Loop. Go to LoopStore.com. Uh, and uh, with me, uh, best way to get me is through LinkedIn. That's the uh, social media platform that I, that I check in on. And please, you know, hook, uh, uh, get in touch with me and I uh, look forward to responding to your message. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been really fun. Rock and roll. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful afternoon. 